again, students. Um, this is another video, a chapter, another chapter in 19th century America. This time we are going to look at Jackson's presidency, 1828-1836. First of all, I apologize for the voice because I'm, um, I am in bed. I have a backache and I cannot move. So I am using the cell phone to record this presentation. It's not very, there isn't much editing in this video. Anyway, when we talk about Jacksonian era um, or Jacksonianism, we usually talk about the era in which Jackson's principles of government were implemented. And this is very much like Jeffersonianism. Remember that Jeffersonianism or Jefferson's principles remained alive long after his um, the end of his second term. But now we are going to start by looking at Jackson's presidency first and to see how uh, some of these principles were established. Uh, some of them are not really uh, the invention of Jefferson, J uh, Jackson himself. They are the result of already uh, ongoing, some ongoing uh, developments, especially reform movements. But they are associated with Jackson anyway. Uh, it is important to understand that Jackson belongs to the category of uh, members of the Republican Party who realize that the Jeffersonian, this, Jeff this Jeffersonian party is no longer uh, loyal to the principles established by Thomas Jefferson, especially concerning the powers of the federal government and states' rights. When they saw that these principles were being violated and betrayed, they developed their own faction inside the, the Republican Party or the Democratic Republican Party. They were called the Democratic Republicans while their opponents, whom we uh, already saw earlier in another lecture, were called National Republicans. Jackson claimed to be going back to the principles of Jefferson, but he was actually going even further than that. He was doing things uh, and adhering to principles that even Jefferson himself would consider as radical, especially in terms of uh, the spoil system, which we'll see in a minute. Now, how did Jackson rise? Uh, how did Jackson's popularity uh, increase and rise? Um, Basically, the reason, the main reason why Jackson became um, prominent, a prominent political figure and won the election of 1828 is the distrust and the dissatisfaction that many factions and many segments of the American society uh, was feeling uh, towards the National Republicans who were taking control of the, go the government. Uh, from 1815, 16 up to 1824 or 1828. Also, Jackson was a military hero, hero of the War of 1812 in the famous Battle of New Orleans, where he uh, demonstrated courage and, uh, uh, and heroism from the American perspective, of course. He was also a very fierce uh, fighter of Indians. Uh, he was basically an outsider, being a member of, being a, being a military man, he was considered an outsider by many, because they were, uh, people were dissatisfied with not just the Republican, the National Republicans, but also with the political elite. They were starting to consider the political elite as a group of people who only serve the interests of the few. And... Uh, this feeling was one of the major consequences of the panic of the panic of 1819, the banking system, the, uh, the financial crisis resulting from the banking system and the American system supported by Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. He was a Westerner, symbol of this new uh, area in the United States, the West. Uh, he was also the champion of agriculture and slavery. Agriculture, slavery were uh, considered under threat by many Southerners because the National Republicans were seen to be just serving the interest of uh, industri industrial um, sects or sections of the uh, American society. 
And another factor was that 58% of white males in 1828 had the right to vote, which means that more and more people who are considered ordinary people could vote. And these, this, this fact ma made these people look for someone who would represent them rather than uh, represent the elite or narrow interests. And because of their dissatisfaction with the ruling class or the, 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 the ruling um, um, faction of the Democratic Republican Party, they resorted to uh, voting for someone who is a symbol of the common man. And Andrew Jackson, ironically, even though he wasn't really a common man, he was an aristocrat, between quotation marks, but um, in many of his uh, actions and in his behavior uh, and his success, rising from uh, rising to um, richness, was very uh, compatible with very compatible with the desires and ambitions of these new voters or this new electoral force. And also, uh, electors in the Electoral College at this time were chosen by popular vote rather than by a uh, limited uh, and small group of the uh, party. So, Andrew Jackson was, or gave the impression of being anti-elite, political elite, anti-banks, anti-federal government, and also he was a symbol of the common man, the symbol of slave holding interests, a symbol of agriculture and the agrarian interests. Now, Jackson's agenda and principles, first of all, Jackson's agenda is very compatible with the uh, faction of the Democratic Republican Party or the Republican Party that had opposed the American system that had opposed the increasing power of the federal government uh, under the National Republican faction of the same party. And this, uh, these, uh, this agenda or these principles are going to be the platform, the future platform of the Democratic Party that would uh, be uh, split, that would split from the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, also, when he came to power, he established the spoil system, which is based on giving office positions to people on the basis of their loyalty rather than on competence. So most of the bureaucratic positions that were that had been occupied by uh, previous um, uh, office holders were given to the uh, to those people who were loyal to Jackson and who supported him in his electoral campaign. To the winner belong the spoils. This is why uh, it was called the spoils system. This was uh, done on purpose to make sure that the people who work in any position, any governmental position, would be loyal to Andrew Jackson and to his uh, view of the government and of, of running the country. Uh, besides this, there was a new principle called the rotation in office, which means that people are not supposed to hold office uh, positions and governmental positions for, 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 for forever. Uh, th there should be a rotation in office each time a new, um, new people take in these positions. This was seen as very radical and negative by many uh, American politicians because this would lead to lack of stability and um, uh, it was like a vulgarization of politics and of government. And another of his principles was the preservation of the Union. Even though Jackson uh, claimed to be a supporter of states' rights in terms of, um, for example, slavery and in terms of tariffs and taxation, he still had uh, or he still thought of the Union as one of his major priorities. And this wasn't incompatible with his defense of state rights. 
he wanted to undo the American system that had been established by Henry Clay and supported by John Quincy Adams, uh, which means that he wanted to reduce government spending to um, kill the bank. Well, the, the symbol of this American system was the second bank of the United States. Uh, he also uh, was very skeptical about the political elite in Congress because he thought of them as um, narrow interest, s servants of narrow interest groups. So he considered himself as president, as a true representative of the people. This is why we will notice that he would sometimes be considered as excessive and exaggerating in terms of how much power he uses as a uh, president. Now, one of the major cases cases in which um, Andrew Jackson is going to demonstrate this belief in the superiority of the president over uh, Congress and the other parts of the government, because according to him, the president is, is the true representative of the people, and also uh, a case in which he is going to demonstrate his attachment to the Union is the nullification crisis of South Carolina. So 1828, the beginning of Jackson's presidency, in 1832, uh, also were years where uh, the issue of tariff uh, protective tariff that uh, had already been established by the National Republican Congress before even uh, Andrew Jackson uh, uh, got uh, to power. Uh, it was called the Tariff of Abominations. So this this tariff was considered by Southerners as um, unfair because it will it hurt the commercial relations that southern states had with foreign powers and at the same time it favored and protected northern interests especially uh, industry and manufacturing as a result one southern state south carolina issued an ordinance of the south carolina ordinance of nullification which declared that the tariffs were null and void in the south carolina territory and that south carolina can choose not to abide by these tariffs. This was based on the argument that the United States as a nation was primarily made by states, which meant that states' sovereignty is uh, superior to the federal government's uh, sovereignty. It was the states that made the United States, that made this federal government and not vice versa. And they threatened secession and detaching themselves from the Union if the federal government imposed those uh, tariffs. So the philosophy behind this was state rights and states' sovereignty. And the arguments uh, were primarily based on the discourse that you find in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions in 1798, which had been... Um, used against the Alien and Sedition Acts that were considered an, an excessive use, excessive use of, pow use of power by the federal government. Jackson considered this as treason because it threatened disunion and it might, according to him, it might have led to the uh, same behavior by other states. He also threatened to use force and he prepared um, he prepared uh, naval uh, and uh, military uh, forces to impose the tariff on South Carolina. Henry Clay came to the rescue, as usual, with a compromise in 1833, where, he, uh, where it was decided that the tariffs would be gradually lowered from 1833 to 1842 until... Uh, they reach the same rates as 1816, the year that the tariffs of 1816, the beginning of the National Republican era. Uh, at the same time that this uh, compromise was signed, another bill was signed, which is the Force Bill, which authorizes uh, or in which Congress authorizes the president to use force to use a military to oblige 
a state, one state, any state, to comply with uh, congressional decisions. And in this case, it was the tariff. So what happened is uh, that South Carolina, after um, getting informed about the compromise, they felt that there was no need for continuing with the nullification. So they repealed the nullif their nullification uh, decisions or decision and accepted the tariff with this compromise, the condition that it would be lowered gradually. But at the same time, they nullified the force bill. Uh, it was not necessary for them to do so, to nullify the force bill, because the force bill would be ineffective uh, since they had already repealed the nullification. But they wanted to do this as a symbolic act to demonstrate their attachment to this principle of the sovereignty of the state. And they also considered the fact that the Congress had to make compromises uh, they, they interpreted this as a proof that their nullification move was uh, efficient and had uh, an impact. Uh, now, another, so, so th this is the nullification crisis. Now, uh, even though Andrew Jackson was not in favor of tariffs, but this time there was a conflict between two principles. The one principle is that of union. Another one is support for tariffs. So he sacrificed his opposition to tariffs in order to maintain uh, the union. And also the tariffs had already been there. It wasn't, they were part of the previous administration and he, um, he could not just uh, repeal them uh, individually. But as far as the bank is concerned, uh, Andrew Jackson was more radical and more direct. So the second bus or bank of the United States regulated state banks uh, in order to prevent them from exaggerating their uh, value of their uh, assets and so on, which is, uh, the, which is what happened in 1819. And also to give credit for businesses and to support uh, infrastructures and uh, building infrastructures and projects which the federal government could not do directly and also to manage the federal government's uh, deposits. The federal government is going to have revenue from tariffs, from taxation and the bank with the 20% the the uh, of its capital being uh, from the government would be used to regulate government funding and government collection of revenue. So what happened in 1832, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster uh, from Congress um, urged Nicholas Biddle, the president of the Bank of the United States, to apply for early recharter. They did not, they were afraid that the bank the second bank of the United States would face the same fate of the first bank, which uh, did not uh, secure a recharter in 1811. So they wanted to move, to anticipate this and to start earlier. The bank was going to, the charter of the bank was going to, um, to end in 1836. So four years before the end of the charter, they wanted to secure an early rechartering of the bank. Jackson vetoed the Congress bill for rechartering the bank because uh, he considered himself the enemy of the bank and he considered he blamed the bank for many of social and economic evils that uh, had happened earlier. Uh, in the election of 1832, Clay lost to Jackson and Martin Van Buren, who was the... Um, who was the um, vice president and uh, what happened is that Andrew Jackson appointed Roger Tiney as third secretary of treasury. The early two secretaries of treasury did not comply with uh, Jackson's recommendations to destroy the bank. So he hired the third secretary of treasury who would, um, who would uh, follow orders of Andrew Jackson. Uh, to, de to destroy the bank. What Tani did was withdrawing federal government deposits from the Bank of the United States and transferred them to uh, 
seven state banks created for this uh, purpose. Uh, they were called the pet banks. They started uh, as six, I think, uh, banks, and then they grew to 300 uh, pet banks. And in this way, uh, there was like a guarantee that the bank would be destroyed completely. So Biddle, the president of the bank, as a retaliation, called in loans and raised interest rates, which led to a mild recession that followed this, and which later on would lead to a financial crisis in 1836-37 during Martin Van Buren's presidency. Uh, Jackson blamed the bank and uh, he uh, made sure that no rechartering bill would be uh, approved and this killed the bank entirely. And by doing so, in addition to the nullification, uh, Jackson considered that he had a victory over Clay and Adams. One of the major consequences of the actions by um, Andrew Jackson, the vetoing the bill, the rechartering bill, the nullification crisis, and also the fact that he used the, the, his veto more times than all the presidents before him combined. He, he vetoed uh, projects for internal improvements besides the bank, uh, the rechartering of the Second Bank of the United States, which meant that he was a fierce opponent of the, um, the American system. This led the National Republicans to be dissatisfied with Jackson. Clay Webster and William Henry uh, Harrison and Zachary, Zachary Taylor were the uh, most prominent uh, politicians who opposed these actions by Jackson. And he, Jackson was considered as a, as a monarch, as a king. He was excess, excessively, or he was excessive in his use of um, execu his executive power as president. And this was considered as a um, form of absolutism, King Andrew I, he was called. So he, um, um, he, he did not expand the power of the federal government, but he expanded the power of the executive branch and uh, basically his own power as president, even though he weakened the other parts of the federal government. Now, the, the Whig Party, which uh, consisted mostly of uh, these national Republicans who were dissatisfied with Jackson's excessive power, uh, wanted the expansion of the federal power uh, with uh, some balance between legislative, judiciary, and the executive, not like... Uh, which is different from Jackson's view of, of the federal government, which is almost entirely um, concentrated in the executive, the executive branch, the president. Very much like uh, Donald Trump nowadays. Uh, and uh, the Whig were popular among evangelical Protestants and commercial classes, uh, merchants, commercial farmers, and... Um, their ideology of reform and uh, expansion and elitism when we say elitism we mean in the positive sense that the the, the country should be run by competent competent elite not by um, you know like the spoiled system where anyone can hold a position in in, in government they were skeptical about immigrants especially irish Catholics, contrary to Democrats, who attracted this group, uh, this ethnic group. And they favored industry and commerce over agriculture because they, they, were, uh, they considered themselves as um, progressive. Now, uh, another uh, aspect of Jackson's presidency was his... Um, 
hostile and aggressive Indian policy or Indian removal. So he had a very hostile view towards Indians, and even before becoming president, he uh, had many battles where he fought the Indians. What he, what, what Jackson wanted to do, to do was remove uh, the Indians uh, that lived, especially the five civilized nations that lived in the eastern part of the United States. He wanted to move them west of the Mississippi into a territory called Indian Territory, which you see in orange, which was established especially for relocating and removing these uh, Native American tribes from these um, five uh, civilized nations. Uh, Cherokee Creek, uh, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and in Florida you have the Seminole or Seminole Indians. So the Removal Act of 1830 made uh, created the Indian Territory, which was uh, outside states' borders, which was a territory not inside any of the states of the United States. So Jackson wanted to remove the Indians to this uh, territory. Uh, they were promised a new land that would uh, be given to them and to their children as long as uh, grass grows and water runs. So these five civilized nations were forced uh, to, to move westward. So what, what happened uh, also is that once one of these states, Georgia, one of the states in which these uh, one of the five nations existed, was Georgia, and there was a there was a case taken to the Supreme Court by Indians, the Cherokee, uh, or there are two cases actually, Cherokee versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, in which the uh, to summarize, in which the Supreme Court supported the tribes because the Supreme Court as part of the national government is supposed to um, protect the jurisdiction and the powers of the federal government and because these na these tribes were considered as uh, nations or foreign nations the dealing with them was part of foreign policy and foreign policy was reserved to the federal government so the state of Georgia for example does not have the right to make any decisions to force or to oblige these uh, Native American tribes and their members to move anywhere because this was part of foreign policy. Now, the Supreme Court decided in favor of Cherokee uh, Indians, but uh, Jackson refused to execute the order made by the Supreme Court. Uh, Chief Justice John Marshall was still alive here. So, um, on purpose, Jackson refused to do this, and the state of Georgia found this like a green light to uh, do to act as it uh, wished towards the Indians. In 1835, there was a treaty that uh, took land from uh, the Cherokees uh, in, in exchange for $5 million. Now, this treaty was uh, signed with a very small group of the Cherokees. And the majority of the Cherokee Indians refused this treaty. But uh, of course, Jackson would not recognize this. And uh, he made uh, the army drive them westward. And thousands along the road perished between um, Cherokee uh, ancestral land and uh, Indian territory. In 1838, five civilized tribes, by 1838, five civilized tribes were forced into Indian territory. And, and this, ter this territory was, uh, this territory was uh, very, had a very hostile climate. So Indians lost their ancestral lands. They were forced to move to Indian territory, uh, which was, which had a um, hostile climate. Thousands of them lost their lives, and they lived in sev separate uh, reservations. They were surrounded by American force forts. So, uh, the famous Trail of Tears is, uh, uh, which which is depicted in the picture here, um, 
demonstrates the um, suffering and the great losses that Native American tribes suffered under Andrew Jackson.